Albert Einstein once said, the music of Mozart is so pure and beautiful that one feels he nearly found it, that it has always existed as part of the inner beauty of the universe, just waiting to be revealed. Musicians get together and discuss the subject of the greatest composer in history. Mozart's name comes up, but, but so do the names of Beethoven and Bach. When the question is rephrased as, who is the greatest genius in the history of Western classical music? I've never heard a single dissenting opinion. And everything there was to do in music, Mozart just did better than everybody else. He, he was the best pianist of his era probably the best conductor. He was a terrific violinist. He composed for every genre. I mean, solo music and chamber music, uh, choral works, operas, symphonies. What really distinguishes Mozart from the other creative titans, though, is the manner in which he composed. You take Beethoven. Beethoven would um, fill up wastebaskets with discarded rough drafts before eventually arriving at a finished masterpiece. Now, Mozart, by contrast, he composed so effortlessly, it seemed almost supernatural. I mean, he could work out entire lengthy, complex pieces in his head while engaged in some other activity like playing billiards. <coughs> I'll tell you one, one story about that. It was the day before the uh, scheduled world premiere of his opera, Don Giovanni. No music existed for the overture. The opera manager was 
panics and he tracked Mozart down. He said, found him. He said, where is it? How much of it have you composed? And Mozart looked at him calmly. He said, oh, it's, it's completely composed. I just haven't written it down yet. <laughs> now, he, he was, I mean, Mozart's prodigious gifts announced themselves when he was a youngster. He, he was, I mean, he's kind of the standard against which all child prodigies are judged, not just in music. But in any domain, born 1756 in Salzburg, Austria, to a family environment which was ideally suited to the cultivation of his talent. His father, Leopold, very well respected uh, violinist, music teacher. His older sister, Nannerl, was a talented pianist. Now, when Nannerl was seven, little baby brother Wolfgang, three years old, was already picking out tunes on her piano. By age four, he was completely consumed by music. He would sit at that piano for hours. He, he, he would, I mean, he actually refused to participate in any childhood game unless it was accompanied by a song or by a march. By age five, he developed his own primitive system of musical notation. And this actually allowed him to compose his own pieces. I want to play for you something that he wrote as a five-year-old. Let me play for you something that he composed two months later. At this point, Leopold suspected that his son was rather special. <laughs> now, Le Leopold decides that he has to share this miracle with the world. Takes a leave of absence from his position in the court orchestra, devotes himself full time to teaching his kids. Also becomes something of an impresario. He arranges for concert appearances for his kids in all of the capitals of Europe. During a nine-year period, Mozart, between the ages of six and 15, he was on the road a full seven years during this period. They played the Mozarts everywhere in Europe. I mean, they played for the King and Queen of France, the King and Queen of England, the Pope. Leopold established a format that was designed to maximize a favorable impression. Nanner was the warm-up act. She'd come out, she'd play a little something, and then Wolfgang would run through a series of tricks. He, 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 would, play a, he would play piano blindfolded, then he'd play on a cloth-covered keyboard, I mean, then he would demonstrate his perfect pitch, his ability to improvise, to sight read, to harmonize melodies. I mean, people were, just everybody, I mean, commoners, aristocrats, everybody was dazzled by this tiny little, you know, trained seal in his repertoire of tricks. Part of his appeal, I mean, beyond his prodigious gifts, was his personality. He was an adorable, affectionate child, completely comfortable with strangers, extroverted, engaged. I mean, there's so many stories about the Mozarts traveling throughout Europe. There was a concert gave as a six-year-old. He, he uh, finished the Imperial Court of Austria. He jumps into the lap of Empress Maria Theresa of Austria and actually starts, according to eyewitnesses, is just kissing her passionately falls off her lap, falls onto the floor where he's picked up by little, the, the empress's daughter, little seven-year-old Marie Antoinette, the future queen of France. And he actually tells her that he plans to marry her when he grows up. <laughs> Everywhere the Mozarts went, they were showered, not only with praise, but with gifts, jewelry, cash. I mean, the cash was particularly important to Leopold. As concerned as he was 
with educating his children. He was, he was obsessed with financial security for his old age. You know, Leopold's unquestionably the dominant figure in that Mozart household. Leopold was a sort of a sober, um, pedantic man, a precise, well-organized. He was a rigid authoritarian. There wasn't a single detail at his kids' lives, too small to be beyond his sphere of attempted control. And initially, at least, his son seemed to be content with this arrangement. He would not take a bite to eat until his father gave him permission. He completely embraced his father's devout Catholicism. He actually had a motto that he said constantly as a youngster. He would say, first comes God, then comes Papa. He said that repeatedly. He had a bedtime ritual every evening through his 10th year. He and his father would walk into his bedroom while he would sing a song that he had composed. Father would place him on the bed while he, the father, would sing the second stanza of the song. And Wolfgang would kiss his father tenderly on the nose and then drift off to sleep. I mean, he seemed largely content in his role as virtuoso prodigy. He's basking in all the adulation. He is just thrilled, really, by the honor that he's bestowing upon his family. But, you know, eventually there, there was some sense, some, some notes of insecurity crept in. There's some, some sense that not all was right in his, his emotional world. One of the uh, n neighbors, close family friend, when th they were in town, said that Mozart used to actually repeatedly ask him, the neighbor, do you love me? And the neighbor said, well, just one time he decided just to play a joke, he'd say, no, I don't love you. And see, he did that, Mozart's eyes welled up with tears. You, know, you, you wonder whether the, the father's heavy-handed teaching methods were contributing to some developing insecurity. He was, Mozart, around, as a youngster, was terribly uncomfortable in listening to the sound of a solo trumpet. Just did not like hearing trumpets. Leopold decided that the best way to address this phobia was through direct assault. And he, he invited his, his colleague, you know, Joseph Schaffner, the trumpeter in the court orchestra, to come home, instructed him to blow notes directly into his son's ear, which he did. Schaffner saw the result. He decided he was never going to do it again. Now, Mozart's mother, Maria Anna Mozart, warm, nurturing woman, she never protected her kids from the excessive demands. And first allegiance was always to her husband. Demands were really excessive. The travels took place during an era, I mean, certainly high infant mortality, but the era of, that was marked by endemic, <clears throat> epidemic diseases. The Mozarts lacked the immunity of the local populations. Mozart, during these childhood tours, contracted uh, scarlet fever, um, smallpox, rheumatic fever, um, typhoid fever also, among other illnesses. And his father would always grumble about, like, you know, mounting expenses, missed income opportunities, and he'd get his kids back in front of audiences even before they were ready from a medical perspective. Now, Mozart eventually incorporated into his bedtime ritual a, um, a saying, an expression, which I think captured well his growing ambivalence toward his father. Yeah, he, what, what he would say was, here's the quote, he would say, Papa, when you grow old, I will put you in a glass case and protect you from any breath of air so that I may always honor you and have you with me. Now, you know, on the one, one level, this is a, yeah, I mean, it's a child's expression of devotion. Dad, I want you around forever. But you can kind of sense the undercurrent of hostility there because, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, needless, I mean, in a glass case like this without any air, Leopold would suffocate. Um, and Mozart throughout his adolescence kept up a furious pace of composing. By the time he's on the brink of adulthood, he's established a recognizable, distinct Mozartian style. I mean, Mozart's music is music of unsurpassed grace, elegance, purity. Um, no false, excessive sentiment. It's music of perfect balance and proportion. I'm, I'm going to demonstrate this by, by playing uh, 
his sonata, uh, Kershaw 331 sonata in A major. Listen to the, um, the simplicity and elegance of the opening theme. You know, on one level, that, that's simple to play. I mean, any, any beginning piano student can play it. But, but to play it with the sort of nuance and phrasing that it deserves is daunting, even to the most seasoned performer. The, the, the late pianist Arthur Schnabel, I think, had a really insightful comment. He said that Mozart's piano music, he said, it's too easy for children and too difficult for artists. Mozart's now a grown-up, and he needs a job. <laughs> he and his father revisit all the capitals of Europe where he dazzled as a youngster. He, he, he's looking to get an appointment as the music director at one of the imperial courts. He is rejected everywhere. It's actually fascinating that the most talented musician of his era never got a single job that he sought during his lifetime. Interesting, actually, to explore the reasons for it. Part, part of the problem was that artists in the 18th century were completely dependent upon the nobility for patronage and support. And Mozart just did not know how to toady, to flatter, to, you know, to play the game. He actually was fairly contemptuous throughout his adult life of people in positions of authority. He said about the, um, the Archduke Maximilian Franz, he said, Stupidity oozes out of his eyes. <laughs> I mean, it's not surprising. He'd go on to write operas like Marriage of Figaro, in which you know the, the commoners make sport of the travails of, of the nobility. I think the main reason he did not get these jobs, though, was that fundamentally he lacked the kind of temperament that would allow him to be the musical director of a court. He was just too immature, irresponsible. Eccentric. You, you can make a case that Mozart never recovered from his unique childhood. I mean, he, he spent his young years, he, he was digesting obscure textbooks on counterpoint, he was writing operas on sophisticated subjects, he was, I mean, he was a family breadwinner and he barely got to participate in any unstructured play.
prodigies rarely grow up to lead normal lives, and Mozart was certainly no exception. I mean, part of the problem, child prodigies, they're overpraised as children. They, uh, they spend too much time with adults, not enough time with other children. They, they tend to focus on one area of inquiry at the expense of a general education. Mozart, he, he never got accustomed to the fact that as a grown-up, the world just didn't rave about him as much as it did when he was a youngster. He, he couldn't, he had trouble accepting that his grown-up life was not going to be, you know, a fantasy of one ecstatic reception after another at, at a royal palace. He was absolutely tone deaf when it came to people. He, he, he managed to, um, he trusted the wrong people, he offended people he didn't mean to offend. He just didn't get people. Colleagues of mine have, have, may have contended that Mozart suffered from, from Asperger's disorder. And they, and they use his um, obvious social deficits and his, um, his intense focus on one area, the area of music, as, as evidence that he belongs somewhere on that high-functioning end of the autistic spectrum. I'm not sure that I agree with that conclusion. I believe that his unique set of experiences really provided a very poor key to the understanding of others. Now, as he made the transition to adulthood, his father was unwilling to relinquish even a small amount of control over his life, and a series of battles ensued over autonomy and individuality. Initially, the battles centered around the subject of musical and compositional style. Listen to this exchange of letters between father and son. Leopold wrote, please compose something short, easy, and popular. Your object is to make a name for yourself and to make money. You must remember that for every 10 connoisseurs, there are at least 100 ignoramuses. <laughs> now, Mozart wrote back, I just completed a symphony. I cannot say whether it will be popular, and to tell the truth, I care very little. It will please the few intelligent people who might be there. And as for the stupid ones, I shall not consider it a great misfortune if they are not pleased. <laughs> now, you know, when he was young, he, he was willing, basically, I mean, he, he was willing to do what his father told him to do, which is to give the audience what it wanted. As he moved into adulthood, it became more imperative for him to follow his aesthetic principles, to, to, to really to find his own voice. Now, Leopold was concerned that he was going to write music that was so esoteric that it would compromise his earning potential. What really worried Leopold, more than anything else, was that his son would become emotionally attached to somebody outside his immediate family. His letters are filled. His letters are filled with comments like the following. He'd write, Leopold, he'd write, trust no one. All men are villains. All those friends are just looking to squeeze you dry. This is my favorite. He, he, he wrote, there is no true friend but a father. <laughs> now, for, for Leopold, women represented the gravest potential danger. Listen to what he wrote to his son. Women are always on the lookout for young people of talent in order to get at their money. Where they are concerned, the greatest reserve and prudence is necessary, nature herself being your enemy. It depends solely on your way of life, whether you die as an ordinary musician, utterly forgotten by the world, or as a famous composer of whom posterity will read. If you are captured by some woman, you will die bedded on straw in an attic full of starving children. <laughs> if not, you leave the world with your family well provided for and your name respected by all. Now, Leopold constantly reminded his son of his ultimate obligation. Quote, I sacrificed everything for you when you were a child. Now you must devote yourself to my welfare as I grow old. All right, in spite of his father's warnings, 
Mozart was unable to resist the siren call of pleasure and, and, and sensuality. He had his first serious romantic relationship when he was 21 years old with a 19-year-old young lady named Maria Anna Mozart. It was the uh, daughter of his father's brother. Mo Mo Mozart would call her the Basel, which means the little cousin. Now Mozart composed, he sent a whole series of love letters to the Basel. These letters are so full of raw, obscene references. I, how many of you saw the movie Amadeus? Show him. Looks like just about everybody. Um, you know, I, I think these letters form the basis for the portrayal of Mozart in that movie Amadeus. Um, Amadeus, by the way, a, a really good movie. It's, it's um, not particularly historically accurate, but it, <laughs> it's got a great soundtrack. Um, <laughs> But, but you know, I, I think these letters form the basis for the portrayal in that movie. I mean, Mozart's depicted, if those of you who remember it, it as, as this obscenity-spewing Bulgarian who just happened to write great music. You know, psychiatrist colleagues of mine have written papers and given presentations insisting that, that Mozart suffered from Tourette's disorder. And, and they offer these letters as evidence of coprolalia, which, which is a term which means obsessive use of obscene language. I actually disagree with their conclusion. Coprolalia is an occasional feature of Tourette's disorder, but, but the diagnosis depends upon um, the, the presence of involuntary motor movements. And there's scant evidence that, that Mozart had any kind of neuromuscular tics. Uh, I, I think, actually, I mean, a better way to understand these letters is that he, he was rebelling against. He was sort of trying to burst out of the constraints imposed upon him by his rigid, authoritarian, really anal father. around this time, a job opened up in the in a music director of the Imperial Court of, of Paris, France. Leopold wants to take him there to, to, so that he can apply for this job. But Le Leopold is a new boss now. The Archbishop of Colorado basically tells Leopold that he's going to fire him if, if he takes off any more time. So Leopold sends his wife instead to chaperone her son to make sure that he's not ensnared by any woman on the trip on the journey to Paris. It was a bad idea. She, she was sick before she took off. She got sicker during the trip. And not that long after they arrived in Paris, she died. 
they were, Leopold heard about it, he was furious. He, he basically told his son that he was responsible for their death, that he, he, he knows how irresponsible he is, sure that if she needed phlebotomy treatments that he wouldn't get them to her in time. And he, he pointed out, actually, that he said 22 years earlier, she had a really difficult labor with you. She almost died during childbirth, and now here it is, 22 years later. He basically told him, wrote, that he could atone for this grievous sin by coming back home and basically spending the rest of his life taking care of him. That's probably what his mother would have wanted him to do. He took what for him was a really menial job. He actually took a job as an organist in his father's court orchestra. He hated it there in Salzburg. He, he, I mean, Salzburg had what for Mozart was a very uninspiring musical life. There, there were no opportunities to write operas or have operas performed. He, I mean, he, he hated it there. He worked there for a couple of years. He chafed wanted to get out. I mean, he told his father that he wanted to travel the world as a freelance musician and fulfill his artistic destiny. His father told him, he said, you know, you're not going to. He said, you're so irresponsible. If I let you out of my sight at all, you're just going to fall apart. Did it for, worked there for a few years, could not stand it. Finally, when he's 25 years old, he picked Mozart, he, uh, picks a fight with his boss, with the Archbishop Colorado, gets himself fired. And against his father's strenuous objection, he leaves Salzburg, moves to Vienna to begin life as a freelance musician, basically lives in Vienna for the rest of his life. Now, he moved in Vienna. He, he, he takes a room. He's, he rents a room at the home of Friedel and Weber. He, he begins pursuing Aloysius' older sister, Josefa, who, who also turns him down. But, but he's more successful with their younger sister, uh, Constanza. Leopold he hears about the courtship, a serious one, and he basically says that Constanza Weber is a woman of very loose morals. He does not like the whole Weber family. And then he tells his son, he says, don't even think about getting married. You know, you still owe me money from the Paris trip. And you know. <laughs> Even before he got his father's grudging approval, he married Constanza. They had six kids of fairly rapid succession. Only two of them survived. Mozart became an immeasurably greater composer after he left home and moved to Vienna. Music history is full of stories of former child prodigies who flame out as adults. There's nothing inevitable about Mozart's transition from Wunderkind to mature master. I mean, there's a completely different set of skills and talents that goes into making an amazing 10-year-old and a productive 30-year-old. Figaro, Don Giovanni, um, Cosi Fantuti, Magic Flute, this is the pinnacle 
of Mozart's career, maybe anybody's creative achievement. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about Don Giovanni because I think Don Giovanni illustrates some interesting connections between Mozart's um, life and his art. He, he, I mean, Don Giovanni is a story of a, uh, of a compulsive seducer of women, a man who uh, basically flouts all conventions about family life, traditions of society, in pursuit of hedonism and self-expression. I think that Mozart felt an intense identification with his character, Don Giovanni. I mean, they, were, they were each, they were both the best in the world at what they did. I mean, Mozart, of course, the, the supreme musician, Don, Don Giovanni, the virtuoso seducer of women. Giovanni stabs the commendatory. He does it to the accompaniment of this chord. As he stabs him. Two hours later in the opera, when you hear a knock on the door, it's a stone statue of the commendatory, he knocks with this heartache, the exact same one. I mean, Mozart is making the musical point that these father figures, I mean, even after death, they remain fixed in the minds of the living. <laughs> Mozart was speaking from personal experience. His father died while he was composing Don Giovanni, but even after his death, the powerful hold that he had over his son's 
Satan did not diminish. When Mozart got the news that his father died, he also got the unsettling news that he was completely cut out of his father's will. Father left his entire considerable estate to his daughter, to Nannerl. And the, the injustice of this arrangement was no, notable when one considers that at this point, Nannerl was extremely comfortable financially. Mozart was struggling. Almost all the money that he had, that Leopold had in the estate, was accumulated during those childhood concert tours. He never really reconciled himself, I believe, to what was missing in his relationship with his father. I, I think he sensed as a youngster that, that he, I mean, he obviously knew that he was admired for his stupendous accomplishments as a musician, but he probably sensed that he wasn't loved for who he was as a person. Edvard Grieg said that Mozart's death at age 35 is the greatest tragedy in the history of music. I'm inclined to agree. You consider the upward trajectory of his skills, his ability as a composer, it actually boggles the mind to imagine what he might have composed had he lived out a normal lifespan. Now, look, we, we, can, we have a choice. We can either bemoan what might have been or we can appreciate what we have. And he, he, he left us with... Um, 41 symphonies and 27 piano concertos and 23 string quartets, etc., etc. Over the more than two centuries since his death, Mozart has been the North Star of music. Countless composers have emulated him. Franz Liszt once said, We owe the greater part of what we are as musicians to this master. He was gifted above all others filled with the most astonishing richness, the loveliest of harmonies, full of nobility and grace, of invention, of passion, of majesty and tenderness. In 1856, Liszt staged a gala 100th birthday celebration in tribute to Mozart. To honor him, Liszt composed a fantasy on Mozart's masterpiece, Don Giovanni. 